Patients vary genetically, and we've seen that their genetic variation makes quite a difference to their susceptibility to disease. Now we're going to take a look at what it does to their ability to process drugs. They vary quite a bit in the enzymes that metabolize drugs. The part of science that looks at this is called pharmacogenomics, and that studies the impact of individual variation on the capacity to deal with drugs. This field really got started in the 1950s. At that time, there was a drug, cleoquinone, that was tested and it was found safe on Europeans, but when it was released in Japan, it killed some Japanese, possibly in interaction with some post-World War II environmental problems. But that made quite clear that from the point of view of drug administration, one cannot assume that a person on one part of the globe is just the same as a person on another part of the globe. A bit later, uh, individual and inter-ethnic variation in the cytochrome P450s and N-acetyltransferases was found also through adverse drug reactions. And now, uh, with all the information we have on the human genome, that can be used to find allelic differences and then to try to predict from them the drug response. The same gene products that metabolize drugs are also involved in processing toxins in food and in smoke, and thus they are involved in the mechanisms that elicit some cancers. And this genetic variation that we see in terms of drug processing ability also mediates the capacity of cancer cells to evolve resistance to chemotherapy. So there are two big classes of uh, enzymes that metabolize drugs. One class uh, consists of the cytochrome P450s. These are hemothiolate proteins, and they are ancient. These go back to beyond our, our last common answer, uh, ancestor with fruit flies or with nematodes. They've evolved by repeated gene duplications, and they now uh, exist in many, many copies. In humans, we have 57 cytochrome P450 genes. They are bound either to the endoplasmic reticulum or to the inner mitochondrial membrane, and they mediate steroid metabolism as well as processing toxins. In the first three of the families of cytochrome P450 genes, there are 23 that account for about three quarters of all of our drug metabolism. Here are, is a table showing those three families. The cytochrome P1s uh, are mainly involved in estrogen metabolism. Cytochrome P2s, drug and steroid metabolism, and cytochrome P3s in drug and testosterone metabolism. There are many pseudogenes in these families and many functional genes. Let's focus on cytochrome P2D6 to see what difference it makes that there is so much variation here. This is what a cytochrome P450 looks like in a ribbon diagram. Inside this highly folded protein, there are two heme groups. Each of them has an iron atom at the center, which is held there by four nitrogen atoms in a flat planar structure. This is the structure that is used in many contexts by living systems to manipulate oxygen. The cytochrome P450s catalyze oxidative reactions, and basically they take a molecule that's got a hydrogen on it, and in the presence of NADPH, nicotine uh, adenine diphosphate, they uh, catalyze a reaction that makes that a hydroxyl group instead of a hydrogen. They're clinically important because they vary so much. If everyone had the same copy, it wouldn't make too much difference to the doctors. But for example, in 1977 in London, a volunteer was uh, taking doses of a hypotensive called debrisoquine. And uh, it had, it's an antihypertensive, and that patient had suddenly very low blood pressure. And in Bonn, uh, about the same time, uh, a patient was taking spartine, an antiarrhythmic, 
and didn't respond well, had heart flutter. Now, the variation at this particular gene is involved in adverse reactions to antiarrhythmics, antidepressants, neuroleptics, antianginals, opioids, amphetamines, and anti-cancer drugs, including tamoxifen. The percentage of people who are poor metabolizers varies strikingly across ethnic groups. Let's just take a look at the contrast. Here's a big table of different ethnic groups. What we have here uh, in the rows are samples taken from Chinese, Japanese, um, uh, African Americans, Ethiopians, and so forth. And what you can see as you look across the columns are numbers and then percentages. This is the number in the sample size. And then these are the per percentages of people who have the first allele, the second allele, the third allele, and so forth. Chinese have a very high percentage of allele number 10, and African Americans have a high percentage of allele number 1. And that makes a striking difference to the way these two groups metabolize the drugs. If we look at a broader set of these drug metabolizing enzymes, this is a cytochrome here, another cytochrome, this is an n transferase. These groups, A, B, C, and D, were defined from genetic variation ignoring the ethnicity of the people. Okay, so these were the best uh, sorts of clusters that could be made based just on neutral genetic variation in the genome. And if we then ask how do the different ethnic groups fall out into these four different clusters where you can see some fairly striking variation in the percentage of different alleles for these drug processing genes, you can see, for example, that 62% of Ethiopians would fall into group A, 24% of them into group C. So there's a fair amount of variation between group A and C. For, for example, in n transferase, you can see the pi, in the pi diagram that there's quite a bit of variation in that enzyme. And Afro-Caribbeans are 21% in group A and about 73% in group C. So you can see that they have reversed representation in these two groups, but they have skin of the same color. That means that if you are a clinician and a person walks into your office and you're trying to figure out, based on the color of their skin, what kind of a drug you should give them, you're liable to make some big mistakes. So the take-home points is that ethnicity is a heads up, but it's not a prediction for drug prescription. And genetic information on individuals would actually reduce error here. So these are the kinds of things that one might want to have on a gene chip before prescribing drugs. There is copy number variation at our uh, paradigm cytochrome gene. It can vary from 2 to 13 copies per individual. It metabolizes a quarter of all of the drugs on the market. Its variation can influence 12 to 14 percent of drug metabolisms, including antidepressants, antiarrhythmics, anti-cancer drugs, and analgesics. Duplications reduce the efficacy of drugs that treat arrhythmia, Alzheimer's, and heroin, but they improve tamoxifen treatment for breast cancer. So one has to have a nuanced interpretation of the genetic information. This is complicated enough that the drug industry now tries to avoid developing drugs that are metabolized by cytochrome P2D6 because they can't really predict very well how individuals re will react. Here is a global map of duplications and deletions. And you can see, for example, that in Papua New Guinea, 23% of the people have duplications and 2.5% have deletions. That's fairly similar to the situation in Ethiopia, but in South Africa, it's the other way around. 5% of the people have duplications and 34% have deletions. So remember, duplications are reducing the efficacy of drugs treating arrhythmia, Alzheimer's and heroin addiction, and they are improving tamoxifen treatment for breast cancer. So I think the take home message on this is that across the globe, people are genetically quite heterogeneous in their reaction to these classes of drugs because of variation in this cytochrome locus. 
It also has impact on drug rehabilitation for addicts. There are polymorphisms in two cytochrome uh, genes that cause individual variation in how much methadone is needed to achieve a given blood concentration. In order to get a plasma concentration of 250 nanograms per, per milliliter, doses of methadone that are as low as 55 milligrams per day or as high as 921 milligrams per day might be required in a 70 kilo patient. That's 16 fold variation in dosage, huge variation. And it can help to explain why some people don't respond at all to methadone. Okay, that's cytochrome P450. Now let's take a look at the second major class of drug metabolizing enzymes, the N-acetyltransferases, particularly uh, NAT1 and NAT2. They activate and deactivate drugs and toxins in the liver cytosol. They have rapid, intermediate, and slow acetylation phenotypes. They were discovered in the early 1950s, in 1953, in patients who were being treated for TB with isoniazid. They metabolize sulfonamides, many other drugs, and they metabolize caffeine. This is another case where there's ethnic variation. Europeans and North Americans are about a quarter fast acetylators, and East Asians are about 70% uh, fast acetylators. So again, as with cytochrome P450, the N-acetyltransferases vary across the globe, and different people have different, different likelihoods of having a particular version. This is what the enzyme looks like. It is, its active parts are sketched here. The movable parts are in red. And it is found in our livers, which are major detoxification factories. Now, given all that background on genetic variation, what difference does it make to cancer? There are really two major pathways of influence. One is, that the impact that environmental toxins, toxins in smoke, air pollution, water pollution, things like that, the impact they have on cancer risk depends on which particular genetic variants for these kinds of enzymes a patient has. So that, that would affect the risk of mutation. The second causal pathway is that the ability of a cancer clone to resist chemotherapy, that is to evolve resistance to chemotherapy, depends both on which genetic variants it acquired during development and which it inherited in the germline. Because after all, cancer cells share almost all of their genes with all the other cells in our body. So let's take a look at a few cases where N-acetyl transferases are mediating cancer risk but doing it because they're interacting with the environment. If you are an NAT2 slow acetylator, you're about one and a half times more likely to get bladder cancer than a random person. If you have a combination of NAT2 slow, NAT1 fast, and either now or ever have smoked cigarettes, then you're 2.73 times as likely to get bladder cancer. So you can see that the interaction with the environment and the interaction between the two genes greatly increases risk. Colorectal cancer. If you are an NAT1 fast acetylator, you have a significantly higher risk. And smoking intensity increased risk for both NAT1 and NAT2. For pancreatic cancer, variation at NAT1 interacts with dietary mutagen intakes. And it does so in men pretty powerfully, but not in women. So there is, it's sex dependent. For many other cancers, polymorphisms of these genes uh, are mediating risk of, of acquisition. So that's true for myeloma, lung, bladder cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, liver, colorectal, and bladder cancer, lots of cancers. So on the one hand, if you have those in the germline, you are going to have genotype by environment interactions that make it more likely that you'll get cancer. 
what happens once you get the cancer? How likely is it that doctors will be able to treat it effectively with drugs? Well, all the cells in cancers are sharing the same capacity to process drugs that all of the other cells in the body have. So that can be inherited from the germline. So patients begin life with different responses to chemotherapy. Then in addition, cancer cells are accumulating many somatic mutations. Now some of these may affect the ability to metabolize drugs and therefore to resist chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, when it's applied, strongly selects the competing clones that are resistant. And some of that resistance is probably attributable to variation in cytochrome P450 and N-acetyltransferase. So this is one locus to look for chemotherapeutic resistance. In summary, in, we all vary in the alleles that process drugs and that deal with environmental chemicals. If these genes cannot process a molecule rapidly enough, it will build up to toxic levels. Cancer cells also vary in their susceptibility to chemicals in the environment, and that accounts for some of the evolution of resistance in cancer treatment. Therefore, if we know the particular genetic constitution of individual patients and individual cancer clones, we can improve treatment outcomes and reduce treatment risks. That's expensive.